So campaign fundamentals. So this is going to kind of cover a wide variety of topics, not very in depth, but we're going to touch on a lot of different things, um, you know, in a little bit. And so hopefully, you know, if something grabs us, we can obviously go in deep. But um, we, what really, um, what the genesis of this presentation was that in, I guess it was late November, early December, the CCC, the Coordinated Campaign Committee, which is the committee at the national level in the Green Party that supports and promotes candidates and campaigns, um, and we mostly do that through training and technical assistance, things like these webinars, in-person campaign schools, um, you know, other kinds of assistance. So we put out a questionnaire to candidates, um, you know, asking them about very different aspects of their campaign. And we got a lot of really interesting data back. I think 47 people completed the survey, which is a pretty good number. That's probably about maybe a third of the candidates that we had last year. So by no means, you know, the entire universe of Green Party candidates, but I think a decent sample. Um, and what we learned is that, you know, there's still some, you know, I don't want to say gaps, but, you know, there's room for improvement, um, as there is with everything. And so we really wanted to kind of learn from that survey and also emphasize pieces of campaigning that we think sometimes, you know, either get overlooked by campaigns in the hectic day-to-day, -day, you know, trying to do all things at once all the time, um, but things that we think are sort of pretty basic and fundamental and important and sort of re-emphasize those things um, and, you know, go from there. So that's kind of our agenda. Um, so I start with this slide. You know, remember, remember the 5th of November. Um, this year, Election Day is November 5th. And for most of you, if you're actually running for office this year, um, this is the goal, right? November 5th. So some of you might be in special elections. Some of you might be not yet running for office, thinking about next year. But if this, if 2019 is your year, it's November 5th. And so, you know, that's just something to keep in mind and realize that at this stage of the game, on April 9th, we're talking about seven months, right? So May, June, July, August, September, October, November, seven months, not a whole lot of time to really get things in gear if you haven't already. So so this is, you know, not for the faint of heart. There's a lot of work to be done ahead of us. Um, okay, so, here's a, so what I promised in the advertising was that we are going to um, you know, talk about, like I said, a variety of things that we're just sort of going to touch on, kicking your campaign into gear, recruiting volunteers, using databases, developing budgets and raising money, using petitioning to build the campaign and not burn out, and then working with your local Green Party chapter. And certainly if other topics come up in discussion phase, that's fine. Um, all right. So kicking your campaign into gear. So one of the interesting things that we learned from, um, you know, from the survey was that a lot of campaigns, um, and of course I don't have note mode in front of me, oh good, I have this animation which I don't want, um, is that a lot of campaigns really didn't start until it was almost, I don't want to say it was too late, but like they didn't start until late in the game. And so, um, so I don't know if you're seeing this, but here in my notes, um, out of the 47 people that we surveyed, 16 people started their campaigns the year before. So these were 2018 candidates, and they said they started their campaign sometime in 2017. Seven people start, um, started in the January to March range, and then 21 people said that they started April or later. And so, you know, April is pretty late to start a campaign, but it can be done. Um, and then within that, we asked a separate question. So not only when did you start your campaign, but when did it, quote unquote, take, feel like it took off? And 11 of those 47 people said that it never, it felt like it never took off. So that's pretty telling. And so that is something that we obviously need to focus on is really like, how do we build that momentum and get pe those campaigns not to just officially announced, but to really feel like they're taking off and getting going. And so my advice, having worked on several campaigns, is you simply have to start. Like, you can't talk about what you're going to do. You actually have to just start doing. Um, 
And I reckon, you know, you have to have a campaign team. And even if that's one other person right now, um, hopefully more, but like some core team, and you gotta, you're building the boat as you sail. And so the core team can expand, more people can be brought on as you discover more volunteers who have expertise um, and who are really motivated. But you, just, you can't wait for some perfect, um, you know, point where one, oh, once we have these five roles filled, then we'll start having you know, regular meetings. Just start. I Starting shows that there is momentum and it helps get people motivated to join something that feels like it's already taking off. Um, you, you really have to have regular meetings. Um, you have to have, you know, a focused group where everyone is getting together. And when I say everyone, I'm talking about that core team and making plans. What's the next event we're going to do? How are we going to raise money for the next thing? Are we going to hire someone? Um, you know, who do we need? How do we get in front of that, um, you know, media outlet? Whatever the question is, however you're trying to get things going, you need to have a regular meeting, ideally I would say weekly, um, but every other week at least, um, where you've got an organized meeting, there's agendas, there's to-dos, there's follow-ups, so that if Joe says that he's going to do X, Y, and Z, you know, if somebody following up with him three days later and said, hey, Joe, did you do X, Y, and Z? You know, and really setting that accountability. Um, and you've got to set that standard, high standard of accountability early on. If people get a pass for, oh, well, I was really busy, it was a tough week at work, yada, yada, like, I'll get to that next week, you know, like, that's maybe not a member of your core team, um, you know, and I know it, it might sound harsh, but you have, like, at this point, there's seven months. Like, there's a sense of urgency here, and this is a high-stakes thing. This is not the long-term marathon race that is party building. This is the sprint to the finish line that is campaigning. And so if people are not ready to do the work that needs to be done in this moment in their lives, like, that's okay. I mean, like, you shouldn't make people feel guilty about it, but just say, Thank you. You know, let's find something else for you to do. Um, because this is the moment. Like, it's all about this race and this moment and getting it done for this, for November 5th. Um, I think, you know, I also think about, you know, when you have the, as you build your campaign, there's sort of like this inner circle and maybe like a middle or medium circle and an outer circle, right? And so your inner circle, who are the people that you're like immediate go to people, like, if somebody approaches you for an endorsement or you have a questionnaire to fill out and you're not sure how to answer a certain question, like who are the three to five people that you would go to immediately for like what's your advice, right? Those That's your inner circle, your core team. And then there's maybe like another, you know, maybe like another 10 to 15 people outside that team, hopefully, ideally, that's what you're building to, to who are kind of in the loop and supporting you at high levels, but aren't in that like almost day to day or week to week decision making. And then there's sort of that larger, like the base of support that you're trying to create and cultivate that sort of larger outer circle. And so one thing that I will say, and I, I say this as someone who's like probably on the cusp of a, I, I'm basically really in the middle circle right now for a local city council race here in Philadelphia. And what's nice is that what I, you know, I'm not, I haven't been able to go to every meeting, um, but I'm still getting emails from the candidate and from the campaign manager talking about the, what's going on. And even though I haven't been able to participate in everything, it's making me feel like, wow, this campaign is doing stuff. It's like it's taken off. It's like there's activity and momentum. And so my other piece of advice of sort of how you, how do you, you know, kicking a campaign into gear in some ways is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like it feels like it's alive and there's stuff happening, you know, if it's alive and there's stuff happening. And part of that is, you know, I don't want to say fake it till you make it, but like putting out some, you know, emails occasionally and some content like, hey, there's a planning meeting next week. Hey, we're going to go petition at the supermarket on Wednesday. Hey, blah, 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 blah. Like, you know, over-communicate with people 
And that will make it feel like, hey, there's a lot going on. This thing is exciting. I need to be a part of it. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is obviously to officially kick it off with either an event or a press release or, you know, even just making sure your website is unveiled. Um, all of those things are ways that you can kick your campaign into high gear um, or into gear at all. Questions, comments? Okay, well, we can just keep moving on and we can have discussion at the end. Okay, um, recruiting volunteers. So switching gears. Um, I just want all this at the, okay. Um, so, the, and this is also true of donors, but generally speaking, you have to ask people frequently and directly. So, yes, you will put out general calls for support, You'll go to your local Green Party meeting and tell everyone there, hey, we really need folks to get involved with the campaign. And you, maybe you'll send some emails to the same effect. Do not confuse that with going up to someone specifically and saying, hey, Melissa, I really want you to be involved in my campaign. What can you do? Or can you do X, Y, and Z? Um, I get asked to volunteer all the time for everything all over the Green Party, and my general response is no, because I'm already overcommitted, right, like a lot of people. And so if I go to a meeting and there's this very general call for volunteers, nine times out of ten, I'm going to ignore it. But if somebody calls me and says, hey, Hillary, can you – make a flyer for next Wednesday's event, I will probably say yes, because I can do that. You know, It's very specific and discreet, and I can do it in 25 minutes, and it's done. So don't, you know, yes, put out general calls for volunteers, but also ask specific people for specific things. Um, you know, if there's somebody who hasn't yet stepped up to the plate to do something, you know, give them a call. Make it personal. Like, not 20 million e-blasts. You know, try to really connect with them. You know, and if somebody can't do the thing that you need, re then that's okay. And just then have a conversation and say, well, what can you do? Like, what is it that you'd like to contribute? Do you have a special skill? Can you donate something to a silent auction? Can you come to an event? Can you host an event? You know, everybody can do something. It's just a matter of figuring out what that thing is. Um, I also think, you know, communicate frequently with your volunteers, like once you get volunteers. Um, you know, you obviously you have to maintain some kind of list so that you know who you're volunteering, you know, who's volunteering for you, um, and to um, be able to stay in touch with them. Um, but... Definitely, again, it's all about that sort of keeping up momentum and making it seem like there's a lot going on, which then actually helps create more things. And sort of you want that upward spiral effect. Um, and the goal with volunteers is also a snowball effect. So then, you know, you have a volunteer, like, great, do you have a friend? Who else can you bring? Do you know two people that could get involved in this campaign? And do those two people know two people? Um, you know, Going back to my notes, and I don't know if this blocks it out for you all if you see these notes, but the average number out of the 47 candidates who responded to the survey, the average number of volunteers on that camp, those campaigns was six. That is not a lot of people. Um, a healthy, even, a, even for a Green Party campaign, a healthy number of volunteers is way higher than six. I would hope and assume that you need more than six people out on election day. Um, you might have... I would, I would be aiming for at least six people on your core team, but then, you know, 20, 30, as many as you can, you know, volunteers doing all kinds of other things for you along the way. All right. Um, I will stop here at this point and also and ask for questions or comments. I have been muting some people strategically for background noise, so apologies. Um, you can also chat in the chat box if you'd like. Okay, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, what positions do we need in our core core group? That's a good question.
question. Um, so, I mean, there's no rule for this. I mean, well, certainly you need a treasurer, like, number one. Almost every, like, legally you need a treasurer. I mean, ideally you have a campaign manager, someone who is, you know, and these can be all volunteer, right? These don't necessarily have to be paid positions. Though certainly if you can raise enough money to pay someone, all the better. Um, but, you know, someone who's kind of in charge of the whole operation, that's different than the candidate, ideally, because the candidate has other things to worry about. Um, but, you know, if you think about the big buckets of work in the campaign, you know, volunteer recruitment, media, fundraising, um, you know, platform and issues, um, you know, election day and get out the vote operations, you know, like just off the top of my head, like each of those sort of domains or buckets of work could be, could have a lead person that is on your core team, right? Um, you know, it doesn't have to be that all those people are sort of represented on the core team, but, you know, like that's a pretty good place to start, you know, thinking about your people, your money, your events, your publicity, um, you know, having someone who's sort of responsible for each of those areas. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. And then to some degree, it's just going to be like who you have around the table and what they're each willing to take on. And, you know, you sort of, you build with what you've got. Um, but yeah, I would, I would think about it kind of by function, if you will. Um, and Stefania says, can you repeat that list one more time? And so again, off the top of my head, I'm thinking about volunteers, fundraising, um, media, platform and issues, um, events could be another thing. Um, at some point, at some other PowerPoint, I have a whole long list of like all the areas and domains of a campaign, but those I'd say are the big ones. Other questions or comments? Okay. So right along. All right. So you switching topics yet again. Um, using a database. So one of the questions we asked candidates was if they had any kind of centralized database that their campaign used to track volunteers, donors, and supporters. And the answers were... 72% said no. So that is pretty shocking. Um, maybe it's also a question of wording. So perhaps when we say database, people think of something way more sophisticated than like an Excel spreadsheet. Um, but, you know, minimally, you need to keep track of who you're interacting with and for what purpose and what their contact information is, right? And so please, it should not be just in your phone, in your contacts, or um, on a scrap of paper. Um, at minimally, it could be an Excel spreadsheet on your computer with name, address, email, phone, right, and roll. Um, even better than an Excel spreadsheet on your computer might be a Google Doc, a Google spreadsheet, in a folder that is shared with your campaign team. You know, everyone should be able to at least get to that level of sophistication because those tools are free. Um, I think, you know, obviously the sort of most sophisticated would be some sort of like, you know, actual database versus a spreadsheet. Um, you know, like Nation Builder has been, has been popular in the Green Party for a while, but there are others. You know, some kind of like cloud-based, a CRM, meaning a customer relationship management system, um, you know, some of you might use these things at work and not even realize, like Salesforce, any kind of database that has people's contact information. And, you know, often these things also have ways of, you know, emailing people or tracking participation in some way. Um, it doesn't have to be this level of sophisticated, but just have something shared because, you know, if that file breaks or you lose the flash drive or your computer fries or whatever happens, you don't want to lose all that information. And ideally, you know, thinking long term and ahead, you also want to pass that information on back to the Green Party and to the next candidate, right? And so you campaigns are fundamentally about, in some ways, growing our list of donors and supporters, people who are, you know, interested in the Green Party in some way, shape, or form. And you know, certainly if you win office, you want to keep that list for your next run. Um, but, you know, even if you don't, you might want to keep that list for your next run. 
and or pass it on to the next person who might run for office so they're not starting from square one. So, you know, keeping data is a big deal and just don't be doing it by yourself in your own little notebook. Questions, comments? Okay, we're just going to fly through this and have a good conversation later. All right, switching topics yet again, developing a budget and raising money. Um, okay, so the first thing is that budgets are plans, right? It's not set in stone. Um, okay, John says he has a comment and he is muted. Thank you, John. I have just unmuted ah, there you. Is. There you go. All right, thank you. Uh, the Google Sheet um, I would say is, is the best option for anybody that's between not computer literate and computer literate. That's that will get it done. Mm -hmm. Nation Builder is a little uh, the the user interface is difficult for anybody who's used to an actual database. I'll say that um, I've tried learning it and it's not fun for me personally to deal with, but it obviously has. Um, huge benefits. So that's uh, the database is almost a difficult one to plan, and you'll learn a lot as you go through it. So, yeah, I mean, thank you for that. So, there's a lot of learning <laughs> throughout all of this. There's a, you know, running for office is a humongous learning curve for most people. Um, you know, I say to everyone, you know, run again because you will have learned so much your first time out and the second time will be a thousand times easier because all of these things, you know, in some ways starting a campaign and running for office is like setting up a small business like overnight, right? And, you know, systems and procedures and ways of doing things that in any other business or organization take months and years to develop, you're sort of creating that you know, by the seat of your pants. Like, oh, that's how we email people. Oh, that's how we use websites. Oh, that's where we get our paper from. Or that's what, you know, this is how we hire people and screen. I mean, like, all of these systems that, you know, in any other place take time to develop, you're just sort of winging it off the seat of your pants in most cases. And so, you know, just realize that you're winging it off the seat of your pants and it takes, and any, in any other normal context, it would take a lot of time and so the first time out, it just often isn't that great because you don't, you don't, you haven't figured it out. And so, you know, yes, there's this huge learning curve. Um, and hopefully, you know, learn from that experience and translate it, you know, put it into future campaigns. You know, that's another reason why, and I know this is kind of a, a long aside, but, you know, when people, like we had somebody who came to our local meeting last month, and so, or I guess it was our state meeting, and said he was really interested in running for Congress next year. And I was like, fabulous, you need to volunteer on someone's campaign right now this year. We have local elections going on in Pennsylvania. Like, do not wait. Do not sit in the sidelines building your plan and your strategy. Like, engage now. Get into the trenches. Work on someone's campaign. See what to do. See what not to do. Start meeting people. Build a base of support. You know, get people to, to know you and to see how it's done and not reinvent the wheel next year when it's your time turn to run for office. Okay, um, so developing a budget and raising money. So budgets, first of all, budgets are plans. They're not set in stone, but, you know, it can be helpful so that at least when it comes to spending money, you're not winging it all along, you know, the year where, oh, we just raised $500, now what should we do with it? Um, so, you know, what I often recommend to people is to have, like, a three-tiered budget, sort of a low, medium, and high. So, like, okay, if we only raise $3,000, this is what we're going to do. If we raise $8,000, we're going to do this. And if we raise $15,000, we're going to do this. And obviously, everyone's numbers are different. Um, but 3000 is apparently a magic number. So, um, again, based on that um, survey that we did of 47 people, the average amount of money spent by those 47 campaigns was $3,000. 10 campaigns out of the 47 said that they raised $0. And it was clear from some of their answers that that was intentionally so. And I will talk about that in a, month, in a moment. 
Um, nine of the 47 raised under $1,000. And five campaigns raised over 10000 So, um, yeah, Green Party campaigns typically don't raise lots of money. Um, but just to put this in perspective, lots of money means different things to different people. Um, I'm pretty sure that in the city of Philadelphia, which granted is a large major city, um, I'm, I think our district attorney um, spent over a million dollars to get that office. Right. So I get that we as Greens want money out of politics, but what we really want is big money out of politics. We want millionaires to not buy elections. Right. That doesn't mean that we that it's credible and believable that you're going to run for office on zero dollars. Like, you know, and this is just my soapbox, but like to me, that's not a badge of honor to say I ran, I, you know, raised no money. To me, that says I'm not serious as a candidate because you have to connect with your voting public. You have to put flyers in their hands, put advertisements on TV, on billboards, on radio, you know, get, you have to get your information out there. How will people know about you? if you're not out and about campaigning, and nine times out of ten, that means handing out stuff, putting out content, whether it's on a website. There's a hundred ways to do it, and most of them cost money. And so, you know, like, plan to raise money. Try to raise money. Don't think, like, well, I only spent $100 on my race, so I have some, like, you know, credibility. Like, no. I mean, to me, like, you're just not – you're not taking it seriously and you're not really trying to win. You're trying to have some like, you know, win some purity contest of money out of politics. And that's not really what we mean when we say money out of politics. We mean big money, corporate money, you know, individuals buying influence. If you can raise a million dollars from, you know, a hundred thousand people each giving a hundred bucks, like fabulous. Like that I think is completely fine. Um, so anyway, you know, have a, have budgets, um, different tiers, try to raise money and get the word out. Um, and then think about how, what your budget is in relation to your overall goals and objectives. And so, you know, I do a whole other spiel on goal setting for campaigns. I think, you know, obviously everyone's goal at some level is to win, and that is a great goal. It may not really be realistic depending on – the size of the race you're running, you know, third party voting history in your state, your city, you know, it's really hard for us as Greens to break out. And so you might have a goal, a secondary goal, or, or even a primary goal that's simply about building the Green Party or promoting a particular issue um, that might be a different goal than just simply winning. And if that's the case, think about your limited dollars strategically. So if you only have a thousand dollars and your goal is to win, you might spend that money on a literature job in a particular neighborhood that has high voter turnout. But if your goal is to influence the debate on a particular issue, you might actually spend your money on, you know, a series of Facebook ad buys that promote like your position on that issue or you might you know you might just spend your money differently based on what you're actually trying to accomplish so just think about what is it that you're trying to accomplish what does it take to do that how much money will it take to do those activities and then that sort of backs you into a budget um just like i think you should ask volunteers specifically and in person you need to ask for money specifically and in person, um, not necessarily in person, but, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, again, I get asked to donate to all kinds of things all the time, and I mostly just ignore it because I'm already a sustainer. I give to the Green Party of the U.S., to my state, to my local. You know, I already feel like I'm giving all over the place. But when somebody asks and says, Hillary, will you give me money for my campaign, I'm more likely to say yes. Um, so ask specific people, specifically, personally, whether it's a phone call, an e you know, I'd say not less than, you know, you can do e-blasts, you should do e-blasts, but also you have to supplement with personal one-on-one, high-touch asking. Um, 
the candidate is the one who really drives fundraising. And people do not want to hear this, but the reality, and this is like, you know, from running for office 101, this is how the Democrats and Republicans do it too, um, and Libertarians and everyone else, the candidate spends, you know, in a, in a professional, like, full-on big money race, the candidate spends three hours a day fundraising. Yeah, that's it. Like, it's like, a, like I'm going to make three hours of phone calls today. That's, like, no one wants to do that. Trust me, I get it. And most candidates don't have the time to do that. And I'm not necessarily suggesting that. But just know, like, your candidate is your biggest asset in terms of raising money. And so everyone else should be doing everything else. But the one thing that the candidate can do better than everybody else is generally raise money. Um, and so, you know, trust me, when Jill Stein calls you and says, hey, will you give money for X, Y, and Z, people write, open their checkbook. Um, you know, there's something magical about hearing from the candidate themselves. So what I, you know, and this is what I told my city council candidate here in Philly, I was like, you know, she's like, where do we, how do we start getting money? And I was like, you need to the list of 100. You make a list, and this is a candidate, makes a list of 100 people that they know personally, not, you know, in the Green Party, but like their mom, their cousin, their third grade teacher, their kid's babysitter, your dentist, your next door neighbor, whomever, people you interact with on a personal level, you make a list of 100 people and you ask each one of those people for money. And, it, you know, it makes a lot of people like cringe. Like we, it's like the worst thing in the world is to have to ask people for money. You have to think of it as giving people an opportunity to contribute to your campaign and the reality is that nine times out of ten, not everybody, but most people, like I guarantee you that if I was running for office, my hairdresser would give me a hundred bucks, not because she's a green and gives a crap about any of my policy positions, but the woman has cut my hair for 20 years, and she would just feel obligated out of a personal sense of, you know, like knowing me to give me money. And so that's how you start. You start with your network. And obviously some people's networks are wealthier than others, but you you just keep asking and you and maybe you're not asking for 100, maybe you're asking for 10, maybe you're asking for 1000. But, you know, I there are many people who will support you will be surprised at your crazy Republican uncle who you have no agreement with who will still give you money because you're in the family. Um, now that's obviously not the, the case for everyone, but it is off, you know, people are surprised at who will give, um, but they have to be asked. All right, any other questions? Okay. Um, I and then just one more thing about budget, because it was in my notes. Um, out of the 47 campaigns, only four of them had at least had one paid staffer. I don't even, I mean, that's not even saying full time, just somebody paid at some level, and one campaign had two. So generally speaking, in the Green Party, we're running a very low dollar campaign with almost no paid staff. And again, that's not necessarily a badge of honor. You know, to me, it's a sign that we just need to get more sophisticated. Um, and we're getting there. You know, every year we're getting more sophisticated than we were. But we have to, you know, we have to keep stepping up our game um, because we're not going to win otherwise, and that's the whole point here. All right, and um, the last couple of things: petitioning, um, petitioning, and and not every state and every campaign has to do this. So it really just depends on your, um, you know, ballot access laws where you are. Um, but in um, many places, you have to petition to get on the ballot, and it often is a very, like, oh, we have to petition, you know, laborious task that just feels, you know, almost as onerous as asking people for money is to go out door to door or at the, you know, you know, at the, on the street corner and ask people for their signatures. But you really have to, like, shift your thinking and your mindset, and maybe you're already doing this, um, and really think of it as an opportunity to campaign. And so, Petitioning can give you an excuse to A, be communicating with volunteers. So again, I just got an email, and it was from another volunteer, so kudos to my city council candidate who's not doing it all by themselves, um, who was like, hey, I went out, I found this list of like every summer festival coming up in Philadelphia, 
um, you know, street fairs and, you know, whatever, you know, and here's this long list of things, and it was an Excel document, and she sent it out to about 20 of us, and it was just like, here's petitioning opportunities for the next three months. You know, like, that's great. Like, it's a, you know, it's another thing to be communicating with volunteers. It's another way to show that there's momentum, you know, and maybe I'm not the average person, but, you know, I was like, ooh, there's a, I don't know who that, who, the person who sent me that email, I have no idea who they are. That's great. That means this candidate is bringing new people into the mix. Um, people who maybe are her personal friends that are helping out and not necessarily green, but that's great. Like, we're growing the base of support. Um, you know, you're getting into the rhythm of organizing events. And so, um, you know, t petitioning can be door to door, but it can also be like, hey, we're going to go to the farmer's market or, hey, we're going to table at, you know, X, like this neighborhood festival. Um, you know, and again, you can start, like it's baby steps. It's like, hey, um, you know, Josephina, can you be the point person for Saturday's tabling? you know, give people some leadership roles, give them a few things to do. It's not necessarily a huge heavy lift, um, but it's, you know, it's something. Like, you're going to be the point person, hear the clipboards, the three volunteers that are coming, make sure they have the instructions, be out there for two hours, report back, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, it's an opportunity, obviously, for, for outreach. So, you know, making sure that people know that you exist and that you're running for office. And so, you know, in some ways, well done petitioning is itself a form of campaigning and it's helping you start to really like think about voter targeting and voter ID um, which are technically separate things um, quite frankly I'm not <laughs> real voter um, I always confuse which is which but one of them is about thinking about who you're trying to target in your campaign are you trying to target um, low-income voters or, you know, female voters or maybe people who haven't yet registered to vote, independent voters, that sort of thing. Um, and then the other one is about once you connect with a potential voter, you know, doing some kind of quick rating scale, like, oh, yeah, this, you know, Mary seemed really enthusiastic about my race, so I'm going to mark her down as a five. And then later on, you know, and then maybe somebody else, like, was, like, spit in my face, and so I'm going to mark them down as a one. And so the, uh, the goal later at the very end of the campaign in get out the vote mode is to sort of remind all your fours and fives to go vote, and you don't remind your ones and twos. Like, the people who said they're not supporting you, they don't need to be reminded to go vote. You're turning out your supporters at that point. But first you have to identify who those supporters are. And so, again, petitioning is a way to be out there and starting to kind of, like, get feelers for who is supporting you. And it's just a great way to connect with voters and, like, talk with people and sort of, you know, in some ways test out messages. And people will ask you, you know, questions about your policy positions and, you know, you have responses and some of those responses may not work so well. And you're, you know, it's, it's real feedback. All right, I think the last thing here before we wrap up, yes, practice talking points, um, is working with your local Green Party. So um, this is something that tends to get people pretty riled up on, I would say, both sides and having been on both sides, the party side and the campaign side. Um, you know, there's sort of no one right answer, but at least in my experience, you know, the ideal scenario and I'm sure there are differing opinions out there, is that, so, you know, legally, the party and campaigns are two separate entities, right? So, like, the party is a registered political organization that raises money and does campaign finance reports, and then campaigns are separate legal entities that also raise money, but then file completely different and separate campaign finance reports. The party chair is not necessarily the campaign manager, the local party treasurer is not necessarily the campaign treasurer. That doesn't mean that the party leadership isn't central to a campaign. It could very well be, and I've seen that many times, particularly when the party reaches out to someone and is like, hey, Paul, will you be our candidate for governor? And then 
it sort of feels like because the party asked, the party sort of shouldering all the responsibility. Um, but ideally, that's not what happens. Ideally, the campaign is its own entity that thrives and grows on its own, connected to but separate from the party. And so, um, in general, campaigns are just more exciting to people than party building, right? I use this metaphor all the time. Running the party is like running a marathon, right? It is a never-ending, long slog, and there's always work to be done. There's always another thing to do. There's always, you know, another campaign cycle. There's just, there's no end, right? Campaigns are sprints. Campaigns have a built-in sense of urgency, like November 5th. That's the goal. Like, that's the target we're running towards. And for whatever, it's a contest. There's going to be a winner and a loser. And for whatever reason, that seems to get our, you know, the American psyche sort of responds to that. People get really excited about campaigns in ways that they don't get excited about joining the party as a whole. And so in general, you know, from the party perspective, the role of campaigns is to sort of cast that wider net and to sort of break out and get more people excited in politics than normally are. And so, you know, the, I mean, look at how the Stein campaign helped the Green Party of the United States. Like, our list vastly expanded because she was out there, you know, with the visibility in the momentum of a presidential year, getting people excited in ways that just didn't happen the year before when we were doing all the same things we were doing, but who nobody was paying attention, right? So campaigns, like, that's the role of a campaign is to sort of generate that excitement and cat like reach a wider audience. And so, you know, a good campaign will grow beyond the party, right? Um, like there will be members of the core team who are not necessarily party regulars. Um, you know, there will be volunteers who are new, donors who are new, um, who are not necessarily registered greens. Like that's okay. You, but you're building the base. You're trying to hook people in um, and this is one of the ways to do that. Um, you know, and I think on the flip side, a good local party is still really involved, right? It's not like, oh, well, the campaign has its own organization and momentum and they're doing their own thing. Like, you know, like, good luck. Somebody else has got that. We don't have to worry about it. You know, the party still has a responsibility to its candidates, often particularly around getting them on the ballot, but like forming that core base of support and most importantly, having the institutional knowledge of what it takes to do this. And so, you know, candidates, first-time candidates, should not have to be figuring out, well, what paperwork do I need to file with the Board of Election? Um, what's the campaign finance reporting like? What's the schedule? Um, how do I get on the ballot? How do I do this? Who's a good vendor to get, you know, lawn signs from? Hopefully, the party and people who have done this before on previous if campaigns have learned some of those things and can pass that knowledge on to the candidate and will also be the backbone of support, the core, the core volunteers who you can always count on to show up at that event to write a few checks, you know, to be there on election day. Um, so, un you know, unfortunately, um, you know, there was a lot of... Um, there was a lot of pe there was a lot of like comments and I don't know if you guys can see this but so one of the questions we asked was like was your local green party like essentially the majority of your campaign operation one of many groups that were activated or essentially non-existent in your campaign and it was all over the spectrum but trending more towards like non-existent so 31 out of 47 candidates said that the green their green party helped them, quote unquote, very little, um, which is really sad and disappointing. Now, in many cases, some cases, maybe they don't have an actual local, which is very possible. Um, five campaigns hit that sweet spot where it was like the Green Party was one of many groups that got mobilized. And then for 11 candidates, it was like the backbone, a great deal of support. Um, there is, again, there's no right answer here, and things evolve and change. My own local has been all of the above for different candidates at different times. We've been the backbone, we've been hardly involved, and we've been one of many groups. 
Um, you know, but in that sweet spot really is that one of many groups, sort of like playing that early critical role, but then hopefully the momentum goes beyond the party and grows and gets more people involved. Um, I guess the final thing I'll say, which was completely unrelated to any of the things I talked about, was just that it came out of the survey, which I thought was interesting, was that the, I, one of the questions we asked was to the candidates was how much time did you spend on average on your campaign, and the average answer was 25 hours a week. Now, before you freak out, um, you know, we asked that like in November, December, and so recency might mean that like, okay, like in October, November, they were spending a lot of time. Um, but it's also, I mean, running for office can be a full-time job. So there were people who said they spent 40 hours a week. There were also people who said they spent one hour a week. And, you know, generally speaking, those were people who also, like, raised no money and felt that their campaign never took off. So, um, you know, it does take a lot of work to get this going, but it's the work that, you know, that will get rewarded in the end. Um, all right. I think that's it. Um, that's the end of my spiel, um, 9.56, which I guess is great timing. And so let's spend another 20 minutes um, and have a conversation. I would love to hear questions, comments. It's, I mean, some of you guys have already done this and have your own experiences. But I'm by no means am I like the only expert in the room. Um, on, when Stefani is asking on how many people won their campaigns, you know, I don't know. Um, we definitely had some wins last year, but I don't know that we asked it on that survey, so I can't tell you like out of those 47 who won and who didn't. But I, we could probably go back and figure that out. All right, I'm going to strategically unmute folks, unless there's a lot of background noise. And I know, like, and I, again, I know I covered, like, 20 different things very quickly, but um, it was meant to be a broad sort of overview. Oh, and John again. I May I jump it. in? Yes, John. I don't think you mentioned social media, uh, but... Yes, that would be a whole other big thing. Yeah, I see many, many, most people relying on Facebook or Twitter. I wouldn't advise that. It's fine to have a, those accounts, certainly, for your campaign, but even easily making a free WordPress web page just for the sake of having it, um, I think, is the, the, the base idea, and then using social media as an extra supplement. Yeah, I mean, I think... Again, and I think there are campaigns, particularly sort of on the zero dollar end of the spectrum, that think that they can run an entirely social media driven campaign. And maybe somewhere out there that has actually worked, but I haven't seen it. Um, you know, it really does take, like, social media is a supplement. It is not a replacement for, you know, the good shoe leather express, as we say, you know, like walking the pavement knocking on doors, connecting with voters, um, you know, you'd be surprised at how, you know, the Twitter sphere can be all excited about something you're doing, but half of those people who are retweeting and thumbs upping and doing stuff could be greens from all over the rest of your co the country exactly. or, you know, yeah. other like political people, but they're not voters in your district. And mm -hmm. so, like, if you're really focused on winning and or growing your, the Green Party locally, get, you know, connecting and being a leader in your community, you have to be in your community talking to your people. And so one of the things, like, you know, we often get this, um, it, you know, issue, like the, the annual national meeting is coming up in Salem, Massachusetts in July. I highly recommend everyone to attend. But I don't really, like, I highly recommend random greens to attend, but if you're running for office this year, don't go to Massachusetts in July. You should be in your district campaigning. Um, you know, like, you should have more important things that you need to be doing in your community than going and hanging out with Green Party members from all over the country, as fun and as awesome as that might be. Send somebody else on your team to go do that. Um, but, yeah, it's it's it is it's hard to you know especially now because it's so easy to just like something and post something and put content out but it is not the same as you know actual old school campaigning 
Um, Carol is asking about free WordPress. What sites do you recommend? Um, we did do a whole webinar on websites. Um, there's all kinds out there. So, I mean, I know Wix, and Cindy mm -hmm. is recommending blogger.com. Um, you could use WordPress. You know, if you want to bite the bullet and pay for something like Nation Builder, like it is both the people management as well as a website. Um, I don't know for sure. I want to say the cheapest is like 30 bucks a month, um, which, you know, for seven months, 12 months, like, you know, it's a few hundred dollars, um, which is generally speaking a good investment, um, you know, but there's all kinds of things out there that are lower cost than that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's sort of different blogging software. Um, so one thing that I'll mention, oh, I hear a barking dog. Sorry, Carol. Um, one thing that I will mention um, is that we do have an archive of other webinars that we've done on various topics. So hopefully you can see my screen. If you go to gpus.org, so not gp.org, gp.org is the more public-facing website of the Green Party. gpus.org is the more internal-facing. So this is mm -hmm. more like committee information and you know, meeting know. minutes and like all kinds of boring stuff like that is. Um, but here in, um, there's one more person being mute here, um, committees and then coordinated campaign committee. And one day we will get a nicer looking website. <clears throat> and then webinars. And this is where, so after tonight's call, I will download the recording and put it up here. Um, there's a couple of videos and other webinars from previous months and years that I recommend. And so um, this first video is yours truly in Orlando doing a campaign school training in Florida from a couple of years ago. Um, Aaron Fox as the co-chair of the CCC doing a whole video, I think, on goal setting, so other things we've talked about. And then there's also recordings of these webinars. Um, so um, one, you know, treasurer stuff, if you've got somebody who's not sure about how to be a treasurer. Um, Is there anything on building a platform? We did, we have done calls on that. Uh, the question is, did we um, record them, and how long ago were they? Um, mm -hmm. Campaign platforms, woohoo, from 2015. Okay. So, you know, let me. The caveat is that these are like raw recordings of these webinars. So there's a lot of you know garbage in the front of the call where people are just signing on and saying hello and you know all that jazz. Um, so, you know, they're not the most engaging, though some of them have been edited and cleaned up. Um, but, you know, more recent and kind of related to platform was the one that we did last month with Jill and Howie on how to run on the Green New Deal, which, you know, was really about, um, you know, how to take a concept like the Green New Deal, which is humongous and national and sort of like translated into like your local school board race or your city council race oh, or I whatever love that. you know. Um, so that's a good one to also listen to. Um, Heck, may I add to that? Yeah. I, um, I, I guess, now I'm not sure, I don't think we seem to be doing that in Wisconsin. We don't take donations from corporations. Uh, do we accept donations from smaller businesses? Like, it, it would seem to be a brilliant idea if we got on board and coordinated with, if there's a solar business or a Anything that's so it really, out, you know. The answer is it depends. So technically speaking, just like campaigns are separate legal entities from the party, mm -hmm. um, each level of the party is its own separate legal entity. So GPUS is one organization, your state party is another, your local party is a third, and every campaign is different. So technically speaking, any one of those groups can have different rules about what money it takes. <laughs> the National Party has the strictest rules that I've come across. That GPUS only takes money from individuals, period, full stop. So we would not take money from unions. We would not take money from green-friendly PACs, though, of course, now that Jill has created a PAC, there's a lot of discussion and debate about that. Um, 
but historically we definitely not take money from corporations and we don't take money from small businesses. So every once in a while someone writes a check from their business account instead of their personal account and we return it. That um, does seem like we're shooting ourselves in the foot right. if so, we're not working with solar yeah. or green. Um, you know, there's a whole slippery slope argument. I will say my sure. state party and my local party are not that strict. And so we have taken money from from progressive unions. We've taken money. Um, we have taken, we haven't really taken, I don't know that we've taken money from businesses, but we have taken like in kind, you know, like we're going to do a silent auction and the local hair salon wants to offer us a gift certificate. Like we've done that. Um, so it really just depends. And it's the campaign candidate is like they're like they're the ones who have to make that rule. But I will say like the thing that distinguishes the Green Party um, over and above every other party that's out there is our you know rule on no corporate money. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would urge everyone to not break that rule. <laughs> um, but you know, um, yeah, I mean everything. I want to say like everything else is like on the table. You know, it's it's a judgment call. But like I think there's a case to be made for small business donations. I think the question is, well, what's the definition of small? You know, all that. But um, mm -hmm. you know, it's a conversation that you should be having in with your local party and in your local community. Um, and then the question was, Jill created a PAC. So I believe, and don't quote me because I don't have all the details, that following the campaign, so like sometime last year, because, you know, she still had the ability to raise money and uh, generate media, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, and that, but she can't legally have a campaign anymore. Um, she created, I think it's called Green... It's either Green Uprising or Green Rising, and I'm sorry that I don't have it in front of me, but um, oh, I don't okay. know if this pack has actually raised any money yet um, and what it is going to do, but it, theoretically it could make endorsements, it could raise money on behalf of candidates. Um, I think it's still sort of in development. Because, you know, and it's separate, you know, like I'm treasurer of the National Party, which means I have almost no knowledge of what Jill might be doing with her own pack because you know, it's, again, another separate sort of legal entity. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, Cassandra. So she put in the link here. Um, and let's check it out. Um, Jill introduces Green Uprising. So there you go. So check it out. Um, and, yeah, so... There's all kinds of things out there. But this gp.org, public-facing website, versus gpus.org, internal website. I will say I'm glad that both of those are at least encrypted web pages. Uh, gp.org was not um, last year. Yeah, you mean that whole SSL thing? Yeah, it's important, especially yeah. if people are submitting personal information. So yep. that's good. I think we finally got... <laughs> nation builder to do that. So I get. I mean, I'm happy to can't keep answering questions. Um, I don't okay, know if there's anything else from the CCC on the call tonight, but yes, go right ahead. That's yeah, the I was, again. Yeah, I was talking to uh, one of my professors today, who's really supportive of me running, and he has some experience um, with running for city council himself, and. He's pretty well connected with people who are political or have been politicians. And one of the questions he asked one of his friends is, you know, how does somebody get elected who has, you know, no experience and they're really young? And the response was is they have to get a union endorsement. But would that go against our rules? Um. So I'm um, sorry, your audio cut out a little bit. So the, your question was, do they have to get a union endorsement, like practically to win in your town, or I, I missed the actual question. Yeah, that was the response from his friend that in order to win, you're not going to be able to win without union endorsements. Well, that's, I mean, certainly that can be very possible. I mean, in many parts of the country, certainly not all of them, you know, unions still have a lot of political power. I mean, certainly here in Philadelphia, you know, it's 
the city is 80% democratic. It is heavily a union town. Um, you know, union endorsements definitely matter. The unions put lots of, not only do they write checks to their candidates that they endorse, they also put a lot of bodies out on the street on election day. Um, so it is, you know, it's a, it's an important and pretty powerful sector. And, you know, we're a party that supports organized labor and has a, you know, pro-union platform that mm-hmm. far and away beats the Democrats, despite, um, you know, the mythology otherwise. Um, so I think, you know, not obviously not all unions are progressive and, you know, are totally in line with our values, but certainly there are many out there. You know, breaking into that is hard. And so... Are we allowed you know, to take union endorsements? Yes, of course. Um, but we can't, we can't take their money? You can. Um, the Green Party nationally, GPUS would not take union money. Okay. But candidates are, I mean, I have, most, many candidates that I have supported and worked on have, take, you know, have gotten union endorsements and taken union money. Um, now, does anyone every have place any... Is different. I mean, so let me just say, like, every place is different. So, like, you really have to talk to your local party. I remember seeing a whole dust-up, I want to say it was Minnesota, I don't remember, where a local candidate got an endorsement of some kind of, like, you know, like an Emily's List kind of organization, like some organization that supports women candidates. And, the, and you know, so it was a pack. And I think the candidate didn't even take the money, just took the endorsement. And it caused a major, like, split and drama and, like, big issue. In so, like, every state has different, like, feelings about this. I think in some places there is this, like, oh, the Green Party doesn't take PAC money. Um, that is not how it is here in Pennsylvania. It is the Green Party doesn't take corporate money, period. Um, but in your community, it might be different. So I just I urge you to talk with your state and local Green Party leadership about what the sort of culture and expectations are around. This. Okay. Now, like I'm wondering off the top of your head. Does anyone know, like, what type of union endorsements we should seek and what, maybe what we should avoid? Um, I mean, that, again, that's really context-specific. Um, you know, I'm also thinking, like, unions are not all the same, and they're also not monolithic. And so just like, you know, GASP, we have factions within the Green Party. There are factions within unions. And so, you know, I'm thinking about, like, the teachers' union here in Philadelphia – you know, there is an independent, progressive, you know, more left-leaning, like, wing of the union that does not have control. Like, they have not won their election, like, their internal election, but they're sort of, like, a very dominant faction within the union. And so, like, and there's a, there's a few Green Party members who are in that faction, and those people have been more, you know, friendly to Green Party campaigns. And so, you know, there's pieces, you know, like every organization is, you know, complicated um, and you might have allies in some and not others. You know, some unions, somebody made a comment in the chat box that like in their community that unions are not very progressive and that certainly can be the case. So I think it really just depends. But, you know, if the reality is that it's like next to impossible to win an election without a union endorsement, like that's something that you need to think about as a you know, as a local party. Um, but, you know, there's no rule. I mean, like, if, I mean, someone will be the first person to win without that endorsement. But, um, but you know, as Greens, like, we're allies of labor. Like, we should be getting union endorsements. Um, you know, it's, it's complicated. It's hard. Thank you. Barbara Jack. Other comments or questions? Barbara Stack. Yeah, Barbara. Hi, this is from Connecticut. Barbara's got loads of experience. <laughs> um, last year I ran for state senate and I got an endorsement of an organization. They were not offering money, and I don't know if I would have taken it. Um, we've had other people who have it, um, been endorsed by 17 um, unions, and uh, they didn't take any money. 
So it all depends on the unions, um, what you're comfortable with, what your region is, what your office is. So there's a difference between accepting money and accepting the endorsement, obviously. Um, and don't be afraid to go to um, um, all of the uh, unions you can get a hold of, and you'll be sometimes you'll be surprised. We had somebody who went to uh, postal workers union, and they said, "Why do you call, why do you want to come to see us? Nobody's no candidates ever come to see us in our 50 year history of being wow. a union." And he said, "Well, let me just come and talk to you." So he went and talked to him, and he got the endorsement. Nice. You know, and sometimes the, your opponent, your, your, your dominant party opponents, do not, uh, they get so kind of comfortable thinking they're going to automatically get the endorsement and money from a particular union, but they don't even go sometimes. And then, like, we had an instance where um, our candidate got the endorsement of a particular union. The Democrat incumbent thought he was going to get it. He didn't go to to be reviewed by the union, and the union said, "Hey, I'm sorry, we gave them, we we already endorsed somebody. You lost your opportunity. You never <laughs> even applied." So there's all kinds of things going out there. Um, so, like I said, it's complicated. <laughs> Over. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, I and mean, that's a really helpful perspective. I would say, you know, one thing to think about. I mean, this is for me. When I think about, like, should we take money, let's say, from Jill's pack, let's, you know, like, and just because it's Jill, does that suddenly make it, like, okay, no matter what? Um, you know, for me, I sort of apply the transitive property, right? Like, we don't take corporate money, and so is that pack taking corporate money? Like, is the pack itself taking money that we wouldn't take, and therefore, is to some degree, it getting washed through that pack? or not, mm -hmm. right? And so that's yeah. like a way to kind of give it the smell test. Um, you know, does that union take money from large corporations and then rebundle it with other people's donations and then turn around and check to you? Like, mm, I wouldn't necessarily take that money. So I think, you know, and you can go to Open Secrets, you can go to, you know, if it's FEC level or, you know, your state board of elections, like there's ways to look up, you know, Every PAC has to file campaign finance reports, so I guess there's that whole new set of dark money PACs where they don't have to disclose, and so I wouldn't take money from those. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's you know, it's a it's it's a good it's a thorny question, and so um, yeah, there's no easy answers here. But um, there was something related that I was going to say, and of course it totally fell out of my head, and now I don't remember. But that's all right. Oh, I mean, the other the way to do it is, you know, another thing to think about is just campaign um, donation limits. Like, I'm not going to take any more than $1,000 from any one person. Or, you know, I think right now you can give up to 2600 to a presidential campaign. So that's like, that's a nice number to, you know, limit. Um, you know, here in Pennsylvania, if you're running for state office, there are zero limits. Like, you can give someone a million dollars. <laughs> Um, it's the wild west, but um, but like the, like if you're running for city office, there are individual contribution limits. But so a lot of greens, you know, sometimes you know self-impose contribution limits, even if they don't exist in the real world by law. But I would urge you to not make limits that are like a hundred dollars. You know, make limits that are you know a couple thousand, like something that you know is not unreasonable and doesn't completely handicap you from raising any serious money. Thanks. All right. Well, it's almost 20 after 10, at least on the East Coast. So I don't know. You know, I'm happy to end it here. Certainly people should have my contact information from the website where you registered for the call. Um, I can also be conveniently reached at treasurer at gp.org, and I'm happy to, you know, just answer questions and help any candidate um, with some some of these basics. So good luck. Thank you. Get out Thank there and just roll up your sleeves and get started and do the work. Take care. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night.